Father in heaven, please help me this morning. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Morning, friends. It's a good morning this morning. You know, anytime you wake up and you're alive, it's a good morning. So Darlene's in there uh, working in the living room in the kitchen. I can hear her. And I'm in here inside where it's warm and cozy and it's cold outside today. I'm just thankful for a good marriage and a warm home. This is a uh, bulb of garlic. And it looks kind of, uh, it's interesting. You can take it apart. It's just, it comes just like a ball, right? But you take it apart, and when you separate it, you separate it into its different parts. They're called cloves. And so you take the cloves, and you take each clove, and you plant it. Now, we planted this uh, a short while ago, and it will be harvested about June of next year. So you plant it. And then next year, by God's grace, we'll harvest garlic. We're approaching the Christmas season. It's time for family, friends, good fellowship, you know, healthy, good food. It's just a blessing to be alive. We have so much. We are so rich in the treasure of peace, a peace that passes, Philippians 4, 7, peace that passes understanding. Here's a picture of Darlene in the olden days. She came to me one morning and she said, Lou, I can't wear the clothes that I've been wearing. I can no longer dress this way. And it took me by surprise. It was a shock to me. And she took me to the closet. She said, you know, look at my clothes. She said, I can't wear that anymore. You know, what had happened, I, at the time I didn't really know what was happening, but what had happened was, you know, God had given her conviction. And she was, she knew that it was not God's will for her to continue dressing like that. Then I had my own experience when the Lord asked me to give up the, you know, the beer and the wine and things. It's, it's, it's hard to explain, but somehow the Lord's able to speak to the heart. You, you read that in 1, uh, 1 Kings 19, verse 12. Elijah had run from Jezebel. The Lord goes out to the wilderness and he says, Elijah's in the cave. What doest thou here? Elijah comes out and there's, you know, there's the storm and there's a, the hurricane and the fire and the lightning and all the different things. These manifestations of nature. And then in verse 12, 1 Kings 19, it says, uh, God spoke with a still small voice. And he does that today. Darlene had heard the still small voice regarding her address. I had heard the still small voice regarding my alcohol consumption. And we knew God was calling us to make a change. And if we had not heeded that voice, we wouldn't have had peace. You know, I think back years and years, many years ago, I was doing Bible meetings in Hershey, Pennsylvania, which is the chocolate capital of the world. <laughs> it may not be the healthiest thing. It's got some, you know, theobromine, methyl xanthine, caffeine. It's got some, it's got some issues. So you had to be very delicate in what you said there in the chocolate capital of the world when it came to the consumption of chocolate. But it was a nice crowd coming out, and on a Sunday morning we had cooking classes, and during the evening we talk about, you know, uh, all the different lifestyle issues and diseases, and a lot of fun talking about sugar and uh, a little weight loss and osteoporosis. A lot of fun, and good to meet the people, meet, make new friends. Had a nice time up there, and while I was there, the organization that had invited me gave me a car to drive. They'd rented a car, and it was a nice new Nissan Altima. And the house I was staying in was about a 30-minute drive from the building where we had our meetings, and I'd drive back and forth. I had a GPS, because I'd get lost in Hershey. I had a GPS going back and forth. I remember one time the police stopped me, and I could honestly say when she said, do you know you're driving like 50 in a 30? I could say, no, ma'am, I don't know that. I'm from Tennessee. <laughs> And uh, she didn't give me a ticket. I was cooking for myself. So I was in the grocery store going to go and buy some food. And I pulled up to the curb and I felt the bottom of the front, you know, the, the bumper scrape the curve. And I got out and looked and I put a little scratch on the bottom of this new bumper. And I got back in the car, drove back home. And as the days passed, I started thinking about the scratch on that bumper. You know, my mind was saying, you know, if they've got insurance on the car, they got to pay deductible. If there's a problem, they have to have it fixed. And it's going to cost this organization money. And when I turn it in at Alamo Car Rental, I should report it. And then, you know, take any financial responsibility to have it repaired. And I was just going back and forth. 
because that's what one voice was saying. But the other voice was saying, you know, it's normal wear and tear. You don't need to report that. They expect this to happen when they rent a car. And uh, it's at the time, it was a real struggle whether I should, when I turn that car in, should report the little bit of damage I did to the front bumper. And as I neared the completion of the meetings, packed up my food for the plane that morning, got in the car, and I was driving to the airport, got in the line to return the car to Alamo. And as I, the man came out to take the car back, of course, you know, he does a quick inspection to make sure there's no problem with the car. I knew if I didn't say something, I'd leave my peace behind in Hershey, Pennsylvania. When I got on the plane, I get on the plane and have no peace. Now, John 14, 27, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives it. You know, it's the kind of peace that the world can't give to you. They don't have it. The world can't give it. The world can't take it away. But the Prince of Peace in Isaiah 9, 6, he gives us something that keeps us in time of trouble and trial and tribulation and temptation. You don't want to lose your peace. And I knew if I didn't say something, when I sat on that Delta flight to come home, I'd sit without any peace. And so I, t by the way, what kind of price can you put on peace? You know, how much would you spend to get your peace back if you didn't have it? And so I told the man, the young guy, I said, look, I pulled into the grocery store. I put a scratch in the bottom of the bumper. He looked at it. He said, ah, it's nothing. He said, that's nothing. <laughs> so I was glad to hear that. Got back on the plane. I ate my little lunch I'd packed, and I had peace. And I think back in the olden days there when Darlene was wrestling with the dress and I was wrestling with the booze, I think we both sensed that if we didn't follow our convictions, that it would kind of put a divide in there between Christ and we'd lose our peace. Now, years later, I went to uh, Ukraine to do health meetings. At a, at, they call it a camp meeting, large organization. They invited people from different places. They were coming together. The invitation I received was to do meetings on mental health. And so that's what I talked about. I talked about, you know, uh, brain stability, how to have a, a mind that is just impervious to stress, and how to, how to attempt to be impervious to stress, anxiety, panic attacks, these kind of things that plague us. A lot of depression in the world today. And so day after day, I was doing my, uh, my meetings on mental health. Now, most of the people there were speaking, you know, Ukrainian or Russian, and they would ask questions between the meetings. I was given a translator named Oleg, a real nice young man. We would sit out on the park bench in front of the meetings, and they would ask their different questions. You know, can this food help me, give me brain stability? Does walking in the morning really make a difference for my mental health? And all the different questions. And one day, a lady asked this question. Now, I'll never forget her, because in this place with hundreds of people, she's the only one I saw with striped knee socks on. Never forget that. So there was a lady that came to Oleg and said she had a question. We went out to the little park bench in front of the convention center, and we sat down, and uh, she shared something with Oleg. He looked at me. He said, here's her question. She's a physician, she's from Moscow, and she's had four surgically terminated pregnancies, and she's never been married. And she wants to know, why would God care? Why would He desire to save her, and can He still love her? And I just gave her the answers that I myself had found in the Bible. And I think she found comfort in the scriptures. Now, that was the day before I'd been in, in, approached by a young man and a young woman. They were inviting me to visit with their father, who had kind of, she said, lost his mind. And I said, Well, where is he? And she said, He's two hours from here. And I said, Is that like walking or is that by car? She said, By car. And I told her, I said, Look, if you can get him here, or find a car and take me there, I'd be happy to meet with him and pray for him. And uh, the young lady, the young man, they departed. Now, I'm going into church, and as I'm going into the church, uh, they stopped me. 
and they said, look, we found a car. Are you still willing to go see my father? Got in the car, beautiful two hour drive across Ukraine, just beautiful countryside, a nice time of the year. And took me to this little uh, like country farmhouse. I went in, the whole family was there. You know, there was, there was cousins and aunts and uncles and the mother and the wife and all children. There were a lot of people there. They were gathered in the living room. Now, I was with a pastor. We picked up a pastor to do the translating. And as we sat down, he said, do we, don't you think we need to ask the people to leave the room? Now, I didn't see any reason to ask him to leave, but he did. So this pastor is sitting there with me and the man across from me, he looks up at the ceiling like this. And this is what he looks like. He looks like he's just, you know, mentally not there. And I just try to engage him in conversation and he doesn't appear to be successful. He's just not there. And so I talked to him about, you know, his diet, his nutrition. Asked me if he was putting things in his mind that might not be the best. Asked him about the exercise program. I say, you already live out in the country. You know, that's a good start toward mental health right there. A nice low stress environment. Do you get outside in the garden? You get some exercise, get the hands busy. There was changes to firing patterns of the mind. Went through all of these basic, you know, mental health principles. And he didn't, he didn't move a jot or a tittle. He just sat there. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what else to say. I was almost ready to say, well, uh, I'll pray and then we're going to leave. But just before then, this idea came into my mind. And I asked him, you know, I'd never asked anybody this before. I said, did you do something to violate your conscience? And when I said that, I got his attention. He looked right at me. I said, did you do something to stifle conviction to violate your conscience? And that man started sharing with me. He was a leader in the church. He had, he had done something, a couple of things, that were very, very serious. And the result was great guilt. And it had driven him right over the edge. And he looked at me. And he asked me the same three questions that Russian physician had asked me. You know, why would God care? Why would He want to save me? How could He still love me? The same questions. And I told him, I said, before I give you the answer, let me share with you what this Russian physician told me, ask me. And I told him the story. And I said, what would you tell her? And of course, this man, he had very nice answers. And I said, those are the answers I give to you. And this man miraculously got his mind back. He, he completely was restored. <laughs> and the pastor, I said, call the family in. And the family came into the room and they looked at him. He didn't have some far off gaze in his eyes. Now he was looking dead serious and solemn. And he told him, I now stand a free man in Christ. My sins have been cast into the sea. I'm going back to my ministry and the family. Just, I, I couldn't believe it. So we sat down to a royal feast at the table. I was sitting beside the husband and it was just like they could not believe what they were seeing. It was a royal feast. It almost makes me think this is, must, this is how it must have been when Jesus healed people back there in the New Testament. The joy and the rejoicing that was felt by the family. Now, that was uh, something that changed the way I thought about mental health. You know, I could see, you know, uh, 1 Timothy 4 verse 2, the conscience can be seared with a hot iron. That means after a time, you can't hear the voice of the Holy Ghost. You're able to disconnect from reality because the anchor that holds our soul is the Holy Spirit. And I was, uh, after that Ukraine experience, I was back in our institution for, for 30 years. I've been connected in one way or another with health institutions. And we treated from time to time people with mental health issues. And there was a young man in our program he was on a 30-day Haldol shot. Every 30 days, they'd give you a, uh, a psychotropic drug called Haldol. And it would basically turn you into more or less a vegetable. And I, I called a physician that I'd worked with, and I told him, I said, look, it's, it's, a hard, it's hard for me to relate, hard for me to communicate with this young man, because it's like his mind just isn't there. I said, but I've noticed that as the 30 days draw to a close, he begins to get his mind back. 
And of course, when that mind comes back, when the mind is, is awakened to life, the negative characteristics that prompted the doctor to prescribe Haldol in the first place also return. And I said, but there seems to be a little window there where I can actually reason and we can communicate. And the physician I was talking to had a lot of experience with mental health issues. He said, that's exactly right. This is the time you've got to speak to his heart. So when we were out for our walk, the morning walk, this was 30 days later, I took him for a long walk knowing that this medication was wearing off. And we walked for miles. And as we were coming back toward the health center, uh, I engaged him in conversation and he could actually sound like a normal human being. You know, his, his faculties were there. And I asked him, have you done anything to violate your conscience? And he looked at me and he said, yes. Now this young man was a Christian, probably 22 years old. He was a Christian. And I said, you have? He said, yes. He said, I'm engaged in a relationship. I'm, I'm in a relationship. I know God does not approve of it. And I said, well, you know, if you've, if you've made a wrong decision, you made a wrong move, and that had ramifications for your mental health, then wouldn't it seem natural that if you do the right thing, it might have some restorative power on your mind? And he looked at me, and we began to talk and reason. And after a while, he said, look, I know what I should do, but I'm not going to do it. He did not follow his convictions. And it wasn't a happy ending. But I got another lesson that the conscience, you know, when you go to bed at night, you put your head on that pillow and you sleep, <laughs> you sleep like a baby. That conscience, the peace that passes understanding, that's something you can't really find in the world. Only God can give you that great gift. That's why they call him, right, Isaiah 9, 6, the Prince of Peace. You know, look, we all have our, 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 our ups and our down days. You know, life sometimes can be a roller coaster, but we don't have to be, uh, we don't have to be dictated to by the feelings and the emotions and the circumstances. God has an override for that, and it's called the peace from Christ. So may God give you peace today. And if you're struggling with something, if you're, uh, if you're kind of fighting conviction on anything, well, you know, I, what I told God when He asked me to stop drinking, you know, I was out there with a Bible and a beer. I was drinking the beer, just brand new Christian, brand new reading the Bible. I mean, just, I hadn't been reading it long at all. I was there with a beer, drinking the beer, reading the Bible. And the Lord spoke to my heart. He answered my prayer. I was praying to understand the Bible. I said, there are parts I don't understand. And I was drinking a beer as I was reading. And then he spoke to my heart. It's the beer of the Bible. You know, he brought me to a decision that day, the beer of the Bible. And what I told the Lord, you know, I tried to be honest. I try to be honest with God. He knows I'm a mess. You know, why try to hide something from God? But, you know, he wants, he desires, you know, simplicity, sincerity, he desires straightforward, you know, uh, communication between my heart and his. And by God's grace, I try to be honest with God. <laughs> and I said, Lord, the booze, you know, the wine, the beer. I love the way it tastes. I like the way it makes me feel. I don't have any desire or intention to stop. But I know you want me to. I am willing to be made willing. If you can give me just one just one small desire to stop, then by your grace I will. And you know He did? He planted in my heart this disposition, this desire to turn away from the booze. And it was not easy. It was a struggle. I start and stop for, for uh, maybe six months, eight months, till I finally, by God's grace, got a victory over it. It wasn't easy. But I could see the Lord, you know, He was uh, giving me more and more of a desire. Because with the realization that it was destroying my health, it was, it was taking a toll on my marriage. It, was, it had no, no uh, lasting benefits. It was all temporal, short-sighted. It was, it was a pit. And as I began to see that, my desire to break away from it began to grow. And I know God gave me that. He'll give it to you too. May God help you today 
to live by conviction. Isaiah 30, 21. You hear, you'll hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. May God give you grace today to walk in the way with Him. And then one day, this, uh, this is not exactly face-to-face -face fellowship because <laughs> I'm looking into a camera. And you're, if you're watching this, you're looking into a monitor or a phone. But one day, face-to-face, -face, the eternal vacation in the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12. Now see we see through a glass darkly, but then face-to-face. -face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as I am known. Now abideth faith, hope, and charity. But you know, of these three, the greatest is, come on, the greatest is love, charity. Blessings to you, my friends. You have a nice day. So most of the time when you see my wife, you see her in the garden working, and I'm the one behind the camera taking the picture. You don't see me working. <laughs> but I assure you, my wife would not let me uh, not work in the garden. So Darlene, this year we've got a, we've got a cup that is running over, Amen. full to overflowing. Amen. Well, I'm, I'm thankful for all the things that Lou said too, except I'm thankful for a wonderful husband and a happy home. And that is such a blessing in the times we're in today. So thank you, Lord, for giving me a good husband. And the garden is my favorite place to be. That's right. And so I just want to share some of the things that the Lord has given us. You know, we moved in May. It took us almost the whole month to move. So we weren't gardening much here before then. We came over on weekends and did a little bit, but it was very um, sporadic and we didn't have time to get a lot done. And it rained a lot. So even when we were here, we couldn't do much. But the Lord blessed in a mighty way anyway. And so I just, I feel like he just poured out the, the windows of heaven in our garden to this time.